Welcome to the third talk in our series, Use in Style and Substance. I'm Mark Steiner. I'm the Associate Dean for Students at South Texas College of Law, Houston. And uh, I realized um, this morning that the four lectures we've had, the four talks, um, are in order the stages of a book. Because two weeks ago, John Neshman talked about the food scene in Houston. And after you heard that talk, he'd say he needs to read a book or he needs to write a book, sorry. The uh, Langston uh, Collins uh, Wilkins last week talked about DJ Screw and uh, Slabs, and he has a manuscript under review uh, presently with the University Press. And this week, our two speakers, Joni Fincham and Dana Duterell, uh, Terrell, uh, have a book coming out this fall. And next week's speaker, uh, Stephen Kleinberg, has a brand new book out about Houston called Prophetic City. So tonight, uh, Dana and Joni will discuss Houston street art and murals. And Dana and Joni are a two-woman team who create personalized guides to Houston and give tours of the city to visitors and residents. Uh, Dana is a Houston native, and Joni is a transplant to the city, and they both provide a, a, both an insider's knowledge and a newcomer's perspective to Houston. In 2015, they started their business, Trip Chandler, which showcases the uniqueness of Houston. And their forthcoming book, 111 Places in Houston, that you must not miss, uh, will be out uh, this fall, and it's available now uh, for pre-order. And before I turn the program over to uh, Dana and Joni, there's a, a question answer function at the bottom of the screen. And if you have questions, um, you know, type those up, and um, we'll get to them at the, the end of the, the presentation. We'll get to whatever questions you have. And um, so give a, a big virtual welcome to Dana Terrell and uh, Joni Fincham. Well, thank you for having us tonight. Dana and I are both um, excited to be here and share our sidewalk stories with you. Um, it's an overview of Houston's street art and mural scene. And we hope you gain a better appreciation of this popular art form from simple graffiti to large scale murals. So first, a little bit about us. Um, as Dean Snyder, Steiner uh, mentioned, we uh, started a business uh, called Trip Chandler in 2015. And our goal was to show off the best of Houston to visitors and locals who want to explore their city. Um, what we do, we write about the city for various online and print publications. And our most exciting project to date is our soon to be released guidebook, 111 places in Houston that you must not miss. It's part of a larger guidebook series that loves to celebrate a city's undersung and most wonderful places. We also offer custom tours. Um, they're also often thematic or neighborhood oriented walking tours. Here you can see Dana showing off some street art for one of our village school tours. And this is a group photo from Professor, Professor Fincham's Art Law Seminar. Um, in our current state of affairs, tours really aren't possible. So tonight we'll take you on a virtual tour of Houston street art scene. So before we kind of get to the, the gritty of it, we also wanted to ask that you stick around to the end because we have a very special giveaway. So we'll just start with a few basic types of graffiti and street art. So this is a tag. Um, basically, tags are stylized letters and symbols which often serve as an artist's signature or moniker. And at their most basic form, they're often done with a marker or spray paint as you see here on this gutter. Um, it's something that can be done quickly and without detection, but they also come in a variety of styles and sizes and shapes and forms, as you can see over here in the other picture, where people have tagged the cement, the parking sign, and the building. Tags are often included on bigger pieces, much like an artist will sign a canvas. Next, we have stencils. And stencils are a design cut into heavy paper, cardboard, or plastic to make a template of an image, text, or a combination thereof. The artist then uses either spray paint or roller uh, paint to stencil the image onto the uh, chosen surface and location. Stencils can be one-off or they can be reused. And um, oftentimes, artists will travel around the world with them, um, such as Shepard Fairey did with his famous Obey stencil. Um, another famous artist that uses stencils is Banksy and his are often one-off. Um, this is a local example um, of Coolidge, who's an artist that you won't see anymore because he got caught. And he's actually a successful artist, 
And so he made a plea deal to give up the illegal gig and keep the situation quiet. So this is one of his few remaining stencils that you can still see around Houston. Next, we have wheat paste, which is posters, drawings, or photos made off-site by the artist, who then later fixes them to a wall or surface using wheat paste, an adhesive made from equal parts flour and water. This is the local artist, Eyesore, who you will often see um, around the city and uses these stylized image of cats. Next is wild styles. And these are elaborate uh, forms of graffiti writing using colorful interlocking letters, symbols, um, which are often undecipherable to non-writers, myself included. Um, but, and while the casual observer often considers these to be simple graffiti, um, wild styles actually take a lot of talent to create and put together, and they're highly regarded by other street artists. And finally, we have a mural. And murals are the large pieces that um, show a single scene, characters, or graphics, and it's probably the form that most people think of as street art today. Murals aren't a new genre, but they certainly have become increasingly popular and more widespread as the street art movement grows. Um, this is a work by Donkey Mom, a local artist here. Um, it's located on the Midtown Bar Social Beer Garden HDX, who I, when I checked their social media recently, had changed their name unofficially to Social Distance Beer Garden HTX. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Dana, who's gonna give us an overview on different types of tagging and works by local artists you've probably seen around the city. Okay, thanks Joni. This is tagging from small to tall. And as Joni mentioned, a tag represents the graffiti artist like a personal signature. And it's something easy to throw on a wall using spray paint, markers, and even stickers, which is where we will start. So in the next slide, we'll see the stickers. Joni, do you... <laughs> Sorry, it's stuck. Okay. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> There we go. Okay. So we got stickers and uh, they're also known as slaps because they're easy to discreetly slap on a surface for instant graffiti gratification. Where do you find them? On the back of stop signs and street signs, poles, utility boxes, and railings. All of these serve as bulletin boards for slaps. While some are printed out like a traditional sticker, others are do it yourself using sometimes named tags as a canvas. So these are two examples of the name tag. And <clears throat> the preferred choice is actually found at the post office, specifically label 288 used for priority mail. I actually stopped in the post office to um, pick up one as an example and there were none to be found. But even better, I have some examples of a finished product. As you can see, the stickers can be just a tag, or they can combine an image with the tag. And, you know, some street artists will package these, you know, as a sticker pack, kind of like trading cards, and sell them on a website, or they can use them simply as just a giveaway. So, in our next slide, we're gonna take a look at an example of sticker art that really functions as a mural. This is by Soder, Texas, and you can see there on the sticker, he puts his Instagram handle on it. And in his sticker mini murals, he often adds Houston flair to TV show characters. This particular st sticker features Bobby Hill from King of the Hill, tricked out in H-Town garb. He's got the Astros jersey, gold teeth, you probably got those, you know, from Houston's grill master, Johnny Dang. One hand is throwing up an H and the other is holding a double styrofoam cup of purple drink against a sea of purple. We can unpack that imagery a little. So the purple is a nod to the potent and occasionally lethal mix of codeine cough syrup and soda popularized in song by the late DJ Screw and the Screwed Up Click. This Houston hip hop reference, if you tuned in last week, um, 
we learned about with Houston Slab and Screw Scholar, Dr. Wil Dr. Langston Colin Wilkin. So be sure to look up, look at it um, on YouTube if you missed it. Okay, so next we're going to take a look at a different kind of sticker, El Charo. So El Charo, this sticker appeared a few years ago and you'd be very hard pressed to find it anymore. In a way, these stickers can sometimes be like a timestamp and uh, you can also think of them as a limited edition. I don't know who created the El Charo sticker, but it's clearly pulled from the Mexican candy brand, much like Warhol's you know, Campbell soup cans. Okay, next. One of the most prolific sticker artists in Houston is also one of the city's most popular muralists. Wiley embraces both sides of street art from the clandestine to the commercial. Wiley uses stickers, this one, like the one you see pictured there, with different fonts as a tag, as well as hand painted two by fours nailed to telephone poles with the word love on them. Most of these you can spot inside the loop, in the Heights, in the Montrose neighborhood, but I spotted one on a trip to Marfa, so there I am with my uh, Wiley Love sighting in West Texas. And as a muralist, Wiley's work commands $15 per square foot, with more depending on the level of detail and design. These two murals are in the fifth ward, but you can see some of his murals for hire at Golden Bagels, Revelry on Richmond, and the Lalo Bar. Okay, so we're gonna leave behind stickers and we're going to look at more traditional tagging where graffiti writers armed with a paint marker or spray paint use utility boxes, underpasses, support columns, dumpsters, and trains as the canvas for tagging. Visibility is a motivating factor in picking a location. With hard to reach spots designed to impress other graffiti writers and making the rest of us wonder how they do that. So billboards are a popular location. This uh, is Give Up, a street artist who was very active in 2009, which is when I took this photo. Using stencil and wheat paste, Give Up covered much of Montrose and the Heights with his stamp, which is how he describes it, usually paired with a razor blade for dramatic effect. Despite his work being a bit of a Debbie Downer and incognito on top of it, in 2010, he was awarded Best Artist in the Houston Press Reader's Poll. He also is featured with his identity concealed in the 2011 documentary, Stick Em Up, which captures the Houston street art scene with a focus on the underground wheat pasting and stencil art in Houston. Okay. So now we fast forward to August of 2019, when Rowdy began appearing in big, often colorful letters, roller painted everywhere, leading to the Houston Chronicle hashtag Rowdy Challenge on Instagram, where residents documented Rowdy tags for fun. The tags were seen inside the loop, they were seen out in the suburbs, even out in LaGrange. And along with all these sightings came public speculation as to who was Rowdy. So on a Texas Aggies forum, there was certainty that affluent kids in the Heights were responsible since so many Rowdy tags were seen on the White Oak Running Trail. Over on Reddit, Houston's version of Peter Parker or Peter Marker might be a former American Ninja contestant, a super fan of the late wrestler Rowdy Roddy Piper, or a very obscure shout out to the taxidermied Labrador from the sitcom Scrubs, who was named Rowdy. Now, for Rowdy, this was the wrong kind of attention. And in the next slide, we'll see, you know, it led to copycats, knockoffs, 
and even some tagging trash talk on the utility box. And on the next slide, we'll see a variation more fitting for Texas with howdy. So if you're a street artist and your tag is getting co-opted, what do you do? We'll see in the next slide. In Rowdy's case, he reverted back to his first tag, toe flop. Less catchy than Rowdy and kind of sounds more like a foot fungus. So this one has not been um, the subject of a Houston Chronicle challenge. So now we're gonna move on to another very busy graffiti writer in Houston, whose name is uh, Remove. He also has some Spider-Man skills as seen here. No net, no harness. Tagging from above is a bare bones operation. A lookout is essential as is the ability to stay laser focused uh, on the tagging at hand. Some graffiti writers use the cam silencer, which is made by placing really strong round magnets on the bottom of the can to prevent the ball bear bearings from rattling. However, an ordinary fridge magnet from your last vacation will not work. And in our next slide, we can take a look at Remove's finish tag. There's one on a fence in Montrose, on the freeway, and on an abandoned downtown building. And then in the next slide, we have another view of Remove paired with the timely message, Remove COVID-19 at the bottom, great idea. And there's also a toe flop above and the howdy that we saw earlier. So, occasionally an act of vandalism, which under the law, all of these examples we've just looked at um, are, Occasionally though, these acts of vandalism become unofficially official, as is the case of Be Someone, which is now considered iconic Houston art. In September of 2012, Be Someone appeared on a train bridge above 45 South and went from being Be Someone's tag to the tag of Houston. Over the last year, a change.org petition was started and now has 35,000 plus signatures requesting the city make it a protected landmark. In lieu of that status, Be Someone takes care of it himself. A few years ago, he was interviewed um, by a TV station at an undisclosed location where he had a mask on pre-COVID and he explained that he created it in the middle of the night and he repaints it when others have altered the tag slash message. There is a theory that he's allowed to do this without fear of arrest as most graffiti writers would get busted returning to the same place. So in the next slide, we can see some alterations that have happened. One, B mattress Mac. There's been B1, B football, and for pandemic season, we have wash your hands. So after wash your hands appeared, a volunteer crew that we'll see in the next slide, they decided to repaint be someone. And in three hours, using two cans of paint and roller brushes, they got the job done. And a photographer went with them to capture the the session. So you can see how it's done, basically leaning over and painting with roller brushes and hoping the train doesn't go by. And next, as of course, there's always a spinoff. So Be Someone, you can buy your own mask from Be Someone's website along with other merch. And now we can take a look at what it looks like now. So currently, uh, George Floyd's name is painted on top of the someone with gray paint. Gray paint is also used by the city to paint over tagging. And it's really up for debate whether the gray touch-ups look better than the tags. But the city is promoting a far more aesthetically pleasing deterrent for walls that, are, that have become tagging magnets. So the city encourages property owners to enlist volunteers or to hire muralists 
to paint the walls since most graffiti writers will not tag a mural. Which takes us to the legal side of street art where Jenny will be our guide. Okay, so we're gonna first start off with small murals. So the Mini Murals Houston project started as a pilot in 2016 with 31 traffic signal utility boxes um, painted in the Southwest area of Houston. And the idea was to bring art to an area that doesn't usually get public art and also increase civic pride. And here you can see that it was a success and with continued support, it has grown to over 200 utility boxes um, painted by local artists. And I'm pretty sure over the last four years, as you've been driving around your neighborhood, you've seen several pop up around you. Um, you can visit this website um, and download tour maps of the mini murals so you can go on walking, biking, or car tours of these mini murals. So as you can see here, it is a sponsored project, so artists are assigned utility boxes. Um, but in general, artists are uh, allowed to pick their, their subject matter. So some of them are more artistic and kind of stick with their own styles, like the one here by two and two of the selfie. And this was actually one of the original um, <clears throat> 31 traffic um, boxes in the pilot project. Um, others like to play tribute to prominent um, figures, like this one here of former Governor Ann Richards, who adorns Heights Boulevard. And finally, you have ones that often give a shout out to their location. So this is one of the newest mini murals in the city, and it's of um, Fitzgerald's, the former music club that was on um, White Oak and has now been torn down and turned into a parking lot. And my favorite part of this mural is that it, it makes Fitzgerald look so nice. Like it never looks that cute and quaint, maybe like way back in the day, but not in recent years. Now we're gonna move on to bigger works of art. Um, there are a variety of commission works around the city, um, from those that Dana was mentioning that, you know, adorn the walls of your favorite restaurants to perhaps you've driven by um, the McDonald's franchise who's, um, he sponsored Gonzo 247 to do a McDonald's Houston space theme like a mural at Graffiti Park. Um, but tonight we're going to look at some of the largest commissions in the city, a couple of recreations, and a personal household work of art. So let's start with Puzzle of Austin La Creation, or the God Mural, as most people call it. And this is a massive mural that's seen on Bannon Street in Midtown. Um, it's the work of French-born artist, Mr. D, whose graffiti uh, career started painting trains in Paris until he moved to Houston in the 90s. He's now known for his popular large-scale uh, works, like this one, and also you probably know his famous work, The Biscuit Wall, the, the paint drift one. And Montrose, that's now actually called the Montrose Rawl because Biscuit, the store, moved across the street. When it was completed in 2014, it was the largest mural in the city, measuring 60 feet tall, 180 feet wide, and 11,000 square feet in total. It took about four weeks to complete, using 500 cans of spray paint and 150 gallons of wall paint. Mr. D estimated its total cost, um, including in-kind donations, to be around 90,000. Um, another estimate was more of 30 to 40,000 of actual expenditure. Either way, a lot of money to spend on a really big mural. Um, the theme is a riff on Michelangelo's creation of Adam on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Um, and the, piece is, the piece's name is supposed to evoke discussions of conservation and preservation. And this is very interesting because the owner of the building um, invests in properties in Midtown with redevelopment potential. And he often invites artists, um, which was you know, part of this project, on his properties to paint murals um, so that it deters crime, but also brings attention to these buildings. Even though he knows that these buildings and subsequently the murals that are painted on them will be demolished when he finds a buyer to probably create the next big um, apartment complex. But in the meantime, he feels the need to make them mean something and pretty and beautify the area. Um, on this work, you can also see the other businesses and organizations who sponsored the work. We'll take a look at another one of Mr. D's um, commissions. And this one is one that's probably familiar to several people at the law school due to its proximity to the school. Um, and this is the Space Dog mural at Texas Auto Directs. And the owners commissioned artist Mr. D to create this Mars space theme mural 
Um, but they especially wanted a tribute to one of the owner's um, dog who he had recently um, lost. And so the dog here is featured in the spacesuit and the keys floating around him, although you can't really see it in the picture, on the tags are the names of all the owners. Um, and Mr. D and his, and his crew of artists, because he kind of works not by himself, because obviously these mega murals, he needs help. Um, they ended up using 100 gallons of paint and 300 cans of spray paint for this mural. And then in 2018, Skydance showed up downtown and it took the title as the largest mural in the city. The Wedge International Tower owners commissioned the artist C. Finley, who's based in Rome but travels around the world to paint her murals. She partnered with the Houston Ballet and based the three leaping dancers on three ballerinas from the Houston Ballet Company. To make the mural, she actually set up a projector from the building across the street projected the image and the outline of the dancers on the building. Then she and a bunch of window washers got on cherry pickers and applied the paint. The mural is 3,000 square feet. So if you think about the God mural was 11,000 square feet, it's nearly three times as large. So our next mural is an example of one that has been given new life. The stunning The Rebirth of Our Nationality was originally painted by the well-known Chicano muralist Leo Tenguma in 1973 on the then Continental Can Company on Canal Street in the East End. Tenguma's work represents the struggles that the Mexican American community encounters living in America. This massive mural was revived in 2018 by local street artist uh, Gonzo247, who worked in consultation with Tenguma to keep, his, uh, to keep true to the spirit of the mural while also adding his colorful style um, and visual effects. Um, Gonzo247 is the artist that you who had the first mural um, on the very first slide that says the Inspired Houston. And I'm sure you've seen his works around the city. Um, it's definitely a mural that you need to see in person. Um, a picture doesn't really capture it, most of all because it's so big. Like this is not even the whole mural. It's very hard to capture in one picture. So it's definitely worth um, a visit. Next, we have Mary's. And this is another work that's been recreated um, as a way to preserve a piece of Houston's gay history. So Mary's was a vital gay bar, essentially the unofficial town hall of Montrose. Um, Blacksmith coffee shop, if you know that, that is, that's the building where Mary's was. Um, it was an institution that served all aspects of the LGBTQ plus community, from gay pride week celebrations to fundraisers and memorials during the AIDS um, epidemic. The bar was also known for its very popular murals by bartender and artist <clears throat> Scott Swobland. His most popular mural that you can see here um, was painted in 1997 depicting um, many of Mary's um, eccentric regulars. Now the city would often receive complaints about his suggestive works, but they were landmarks for the LGBT community and the bar loved them, so they stayed. When the bar did close though, this iconic Mary's mural was buffed by the building's new owner and it was taken as a slight to the community. Various efforts to save it occurred, but they failed. And eventually though, it was um, resurrected in the Phoenix Room at Houston Eagle, a Levi and Leather Bar in Montrose. So now, if you go upstairs to the small upstairs space dedicated to Houston's LGB LGBTQ uh, plus history, um, you can see the replication of the work that Scott Swoveland painted um, across from the bar. And finally, we're going to end this with the, um, the fact that it's not just businesses who commission murals. This is actually Dana's personal mural, and I'm going to let her tell you how it came to be. Okay, thanks, Joni. So, Muck Rock is an artist based in California whose name is Jules Muck. I saw her work on Instagram and I fell in love with her busy bunnies, which are her signature motifs. My husband and I saw on Instagram that she was coming through Houston on a road trip and was available for commissions as she passed through. $200 cash and 45 minutes later, we had our very own Muck Rock masterpiece, which greets us every morning in the kitchen and I'm sure the landscaper and exterminator get a kick out of it too. Muck Rock does a lot of celebrities and athletes in mural form with a certain amount of artistic license, which is not always appreciated. 
For a mural of NBA legend Larry Bird in Indiana, she added tattoos to Larry's tattoo-free body, including one with the busy bunnies, which led to Larry's lawyer asking for a tattoo removal. Muckrock complied and she painlessly removed all nine of Larry's tats. So what I would tell you, my advice, if you are going to hire a muralist, treat it like getting a tattoo. Be sure the design and the location is something that you can live with. If not, you might want to buy a t-shirt instead. <laughs> And in the next slide, we've got two muckrock murals that you can currently see in Houston, besides mine. The, the first one is across from Moody Park, and the red lips are on 20th Street and the Heights. Okay, well, speaking of where you can see murals, next we're going to talk about our street art galleries. These are the places we suggest um, you to go hit up and go look um, to find, you know, everything from graffiti tags to beautiful book murals. So continuing with the commission's theme, we're going to start indoors at St. Arnold's in their newish restaurant, um, or as we like to call it, their chapel to beer. So when they built the new restaurant and beer garden, they commissioned um, local artists to paint the so six different alcoves. Um, the artists were given free reign, the only caveat being that they had to paint three walls. And the end result is these six amazing murals. Um, all are floor to ceiling and even two artists painted the tables within the alcoves. And the ending result is truly an Easter egg hunt of biblical and brewing references as you look through all of them. Um, there's one that you can see here in this first photo. Um, that's actually the devil playing the keyboards and that artist decided that although everyone else was going with the biblical heavenly features, you can't have heaven without hell. So that's why there's the devil. Um, and then in this other mural that we have featured here, um, it's titled Garden of Eden. So there's lots of references um, to the Bible and a few um, beer brewing process references. But the interesting fact is all the characters um, have faces of friends and family of the artist. And sadly, um, you can't in dine indoors at St. Arnold's right now because of um, COVID. Um, but you could still go and check out the surrounding warehouses and businesses that have lots of permission walls where they are covered in murals. These are two very popular ones that, as far as we know, are still there right now. Um, and you can also always go to St. Arnold pick up some food to go um, and check out their uh, art cars in their garage ent entrance, which some people might even call moving murals. So next we have the art alley at Sawyer Yards. So this is in the shadow of the former si rice silos, um, which is now a gallery space. And the art alley showcases 800 feet of murals by local and international artists. Interestingly enough, um, two of the, the couple of the images that you see in this mural, <clears throat> in this picture, are no longer there because they are expanding the retail space, so they removed and made some more doors. Um, but what they did do is they kept the painted cinder blocks and then kind of recreated a mosaic with the remnants. Um, so you can kind of still see the art, you just have to use your imagination. Um, and then we have the go-to destination in Houston for murals, um, Graffiti Park, which is an Edo. It's a collection of occupied businesses and empty buildings at the corner of Leland and St. Emanuel Streets and is covered in every form of street art from the simple tagging, um, which you saw in the first picture, that's the, um, the gutter there that you can see by the angel wings, um, to everything from, you know, major murals that have been there for years. Um, although some of the long-standing murals remain untouched, um, others are short-lived to make way for new arrivals. Um, recent works include the Kobe mural featured here and the Houston's hip hop scene tribute. Um, so when you go to Graffiti Park, it's always busy. You will see everything from quinceanera photo shoots, family portraits, tour groups. Um, I've even seen local bands filming music videos there, dance troops um, doing videos there. Um, and oftentimes you also see parents taking pictures of their little ones. Um, so I happen to have my extra cute sidekick when I was out seeing what new murals were up at Graffiti Park for the talk. 
And it was perfect because he was wearing a heart shirt and there's this new heart mom mural. So we grabbed the photo. Um, but it is nice because you go there and the murals do change frequently. And these were all brand new murals to me. Uh, so nearby Graffiti Park, um, when we take people on tours, we often walk over to the Eighth Wonder Walls, um, which are just across the street from the brewery. Um, however, I was driving by the other day and I noticed that they had all been buffed. Um, whether it's a new owner of the building or they're making way for something new, we don't know. But it does get to the idea of the temporary nature of these um, art pieces. And I think it's this ephemeral nature that also attracts both the artists and fans of two street art. It's the idea that you put your art out there and it's no longer there for you to control. It could last a week, a month. Um, and in this case, many of these murals have been there for years, but eventually they're gone. Um, just like the one that you see here, this Warhol and Basquiat portrait as Beavis and Butthead. This mural is now retired, as well as several of Donkey Boy and Donkey Mom's popular murals that were there including Wonder Woman holding the Eighth Wonder truck. Um, luckily for us, you can still pop into the brewery um, to see the uh, Donkey Boy and Donkey Mom signature pop culture style, um, especially because uh, Donkey Boy is the brewery's resident artist and he designs many of the beer labels and merchandise. Next, we have the Ham or the Harrisburg Art Museum. Um, this is another popular spot for murals. All the garage doors at this empty warehouse are covered in pieces by local, national, and international artists. Um, here in this picture is the backside of the warehouse, and um, you can't really see it in this picture, but if you go full out, it says, it says Houston, Texas, um, which is pretty cool to see. Um, and the space was created by uh, Daniel Anguilu, who goes by the artist name Wea. And it's kind of interesting because like many other graffiti artists, he started his career painting trains. Um, and now he's actually a Metro rail driver is his full-time day job. And his route passes by the ham. About 10 years ago, he approached the owner of this warehouse about allowing him and other local graffiti artists to, save, uh, to have a safe space to express themselves and show the community their work. The idea, idea eventually evolved into calling it a museum just to kind of challenge the concept of what is a museum and what people consider art. Um, but as you can see, there are rules. Um, you have to have permission to paint on one of the garage doors. And these, um, your, these garage doors that you see here facing the front um, of Harrisburg are often reserved for visiting artists wanting to leave a gift to the city. Right now, you can't get up close to the murals, unfortunately. Amazon has temporarily rented the parking lot for their trucks. Um, but again, this kind of gets to the idea of street art is temporary. I mean, this project has been going on for 10 years. That entire time that warehouse has been for sale. So its future has always been uncertain. Um, and you probably have seen a lot of Wea's or Daniel Nguilu's art around the city. Um, his Water is Life mural that you see here is definitely um, a representative of his signature geometric style. And many of his murals deal with the ideas of environmental issues and social justice, which takes us to our final topic, social justice, where murals are potentially the new monuments. So this is Wea or Daniel Anguilu's most recent work he put up at the graffiti park. The, interestingly enough, the vote portion of this mural was actually part of a piece he did earlier for a local judicial race. He then went back and replaced the candidate's face with George Floyd and the infamous phrase, I can't breathe. Now, as a quick aside to this more serious topic, um, this was when I was there just this week taking pictures. And if you notice, there's rollers and paint cans out. Um, Remove was actually there painting his tag. So I had the opportunity to meet him and his lookout, who's also another graffiti artist. And they were really nice. They were a little hesitant to speak to me, um, but luckily I had my cute sidekick. So then they were happy to talk to me. Um, and so it was interesting to hear them talk about climbing on buildings, kind of the thrill of not getting caught. Um, and, you know, they definitely see themselves um, not as street artists, but as graffiti artists. And they see themselves different um, as way at, and they even pointed that out. Um, but going back to George Floyd, um, many murals popped up around the city, especially in the third ward where he grew up. Um, here's a couple examples that we've seen. Um, one is a, on a bail bonds um, marking the eight minutes and 46 seconds. 
You also have the poignant addition of his memorial next to Trayvon Martin's, which has been there for years on the site of Green Vegan on Almeida. And finally, the Breakfast Club commissioned um, Reginald Adams to create this mural on the site of their popular restaurant. Um, and this one has probably become the most iconic George Floyd mural in this city. It was painted by Donkey Boy and Donkey Mom, just a few blocks away from where Floyd grew up. And <clears throat> on the heels of George Floyd, Houston has also seen many Vanessa Guillen murals um, painted in her memory. If you haven't already, I would really encourage you to read Donkey Boy's recent op-ed in the Houston Chronicle that came out this weekend um, about his works about George Floyd and Vanessa Guillen. He really speaks about how murals can spark conversation, um, create calls for action, and serve as a place for a community to gather and mourn the loss of loved ones. Um, he's actually working right now to, with other artists to see that there are 20 more murals of Vanessa around the city, one for each year of her life. Um, these are a few of the other ones that I was able to find painted on Instagram um, that are around the city. And if you kind of look around the, some of the different hashtags, you'll, you'll be able to see more out there. So in this way, street art is kind of the perfect medium for social justice. These memorials and calls to action can be put up in a few hours and can last for years, or they can evolve just as a movement evolves. So it'll be interesting to watch the evolution of Houston street art um, as it continues to transition from the background to the forefront of these social movements. And that is what we were going to end with this evening. So we wanted to remind you how you can find out more about us. Um, please follow along on Instagram and Facebook um, we, and Twitter. We love to share murals that we're finding around the city. We love to share events that are happening around the city. Um, and finally, as we promised, there is a giveaway. <clears throat> So those lovely stickers that Dana had showed you earlier were gifted to us by an artist here in town and they, he gave us lots of them. So we decided to put them into three little packs and the first three people to pre-order our guidebook, email us a screenshot, we will actually send you a package in the mail of a bunch of fun stickers for you to have. And you can become your own artist. You can go slap them around everywhere. Well, that was great. Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, so what's uh, each of you's favorite um, street art or mural in town? Mm. Well, besides mine. Pretty <laughs> um, <laughs> um, mine. Okay. Um, so, um, it's, it's unfortunately recently retired, but the, the Sawyer Yards mural, the, the 800 foot long mural, uh, Jessica Rice, who we, we didn't feature, she does these really beautiful uh, murals. She's a school teacher. And her work is really, it's really very, very beautiful, very pretty. On the more street art, uh, side, there's a muralist or a street artist who goes by the name Ack and ACK, and his are really funny. They're very, uh, they're very silly. They always have like a, a character who is, you know, is, is usually got some kind of like, well, it just looks like he's drooling. <laughs> and you'll find those um, all around, usually with other kind of bundled with other muralists. So it's kind of like these characters interact with each other, but that one's really kind of fun. And silly. I, well, I'll jump in on that. So yeah, so a fun kind of graffiti one would be an act one that is over at the Station Museum off of Alabama. Sometimes they cover it up with other things, but otherwise they don't. So it's basically it's these big townhomes coming in and eating all the tiny little bungalows. Um, but they also have the Station Museum like as part of the mural and there's like the, um, the, the trash can, the big trash can. And at that time, there was a Wiley sticker there. And he even like, he like put his own thing over it just to kind of like do kind of like a fun little play with Wiley. So that was kind of fun. And then on a more, I mean, that's kind of the thing about street art and why we called it sidewalk stories because there's so many different variations. Um, so this, I mean, I, it is kind of street art because it's out there, it's public art and it's a mural. I love um, the Wild Wonderland in, in Midtown Park by Dixie Friend Gay, it's a mosaic. 
So it's very different as far as straight up street art, but it's all the flora and fauna of Houston. It's bright, it's colorful, it's gorgeous. And it's really fun because it's right on the street care line. You can look up and also then see um, the God mural. So you kind of get a bit of everything. We have a, uh, a question. Um, where do you anticipate street art going as a movement in the next year? And how will, how will it continue to be influenced by current events? Oh, I only see that continuing. I mean, if you look at how street art has become incorporated into the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I mean, it's just amazing to see what's going on with um, the justice for Vanessa Guillen. Um, I don't see that this will ever kind of stop um, with moving forward with other social issues. And I mean, I'm, yes, and, and I think about it too. I mean, sorry. And if you think about it too, it's that's not necessarily a new new thing to murals. I mean, think about the rebirth of our, our nationality. That, that, that was in 1973. Um, and that was very much about social justice and um, dealing with the oppression of minorities. And I think the, the location specificness of it, it's, it's the placement has just as much meaning as the mural itself. You know, they're not just going to be in, you know, downtown or an area where it might get a lot of foot traffic. It's actually becoming more meaningful to have it in a place where people have to actually venture to it to maybe where Joy, George Floyd lived or near where Vanessa Gann went to school. So it kind of really gives you much more of a personal connection with this person or with the movement. We don't have a picture of it, but even in, in the neighborhood Independence Heights, they, uh, members of a church there had a Black Towns Matter painted on one of the streets there. So, which you can really only see, you know, via drone. I mean, those are the kind of murals that are harder to photograph on the street level. So I do think that's something else that we're seeing is, you know, so many murals, you know, in tagging, it's all inside the loop, but now we're seeing it go into other neighborhoods to really um, have another layer of meaning and, and significance to it. The, the next question is, uh, you'd mentioned the graffiti artist Coolidge has gone straight. <laughs> Where can you find Coolidge art now? We can't tell you that. So, wow. so that was the whole thing. He was straight. He went, and that was kind of his fun, like, side, side, like, alter ego. So mm -hmm. when he got caught, he put, he said, no more on the alter ego if you guys promise not to make this a big deal that I got caught doing street art. So, yeah, so he's... Um, we were sworn to secrecy when we were given this information a few years ago. All right. But yes, but, and, and I would also say his, he, he does very well. He's a very successful artist, so. And uh, the next question is, how many street artists have formal training for their drawing skills versus just being self-taught? I'm amazed at how many are self-taught and are so good. Uh, there's one, uh, Annette Ronan, she does a lot of murals in the city. Self -taught. Uh, I think a lot of them really, you know, just in some ways, I think even reading about like Donkey Boy, it was kind of where he had felt like, oh, maybe I'm not good enough, but then you keep doing it and they really develop these skills. And that, that's what's amazing is just uh, keeping at it. Uh, well, and it's even more interesting with Donkey Boy is that um, you have his mom, who she's an untrained artist, but she's the one who really kind of helped him learn, you know, encouraged him to draw and to paint and they, you know, kind of work together. So, I mean, I would say a large majority of them are, are self-taught, um, but then they kind of, but in a way it's, a, I mean, they're constantly out there painting, they're constantly getting feedback from other street artists, you know, like if it's not good, your mural isn't going to stay up. So, you know, that's kind of one of the um, street rules is that you don't go paint over a mural unless you can put something better up. So if you put up a bad mural, you're probably not going to last very long. Um, and then, you know, you just kind of maybe some of them have switched to, you know, fine art. Um, there's a lot of them that that also do a lot of very different um, actual, you know, canvas commissions, and you'll see them on their Instagram feeds or just around it. It's completely different than their street artist style. All right. 
Well, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, and don't forget, you can pre-order 111 places in Houston that you must not miss. Uh, I know this for a fact because I pre-ordered it already. And um, <laughs> I may have been the first. And uh, don't forget, next week we'll have the last talk of the series. Dr. Steven Kleinberg will discuss his latest book, Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America. And he'll be discussing that with Dean Barry. And uh, also remember that all lectures are available on YouTube and uh, on the series webpage, which is sccl.edu slash Houston dash speakers dash series. So that's Houston dash speakers dash series at the STL, STCL site. And it has links to the YouTube uh, videos and also has some other things uh, like John Neshman has his list out as a uh, document from the uh, 60. So, um, so, it, so this lecture um, talk will also be available on uh, YouTube and that will probably be up maybe even tomorrow um, for anybody who uh, missed it. If you want to recommend it to people, it will be available. But uh, thank you again, uh, Johnny and Dana for a, a really great talk. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, it was great.